In our next lesson on protein synthesis from chapter 22, we want to look at translation elongation. We'll see a couple of factors involved in this process and they are denoted as EFs, that is elongation factors. First we have EFTU, this is the prokaryotic elongation factor. In our illustration here, EFTU, the protein, is highlighted in the ribbon diagram in blue and it's bound to, its, to a tRNA molecule and stick model in red. Of course, this tRNA would be properly charged with its amino acid. So the amino acyl tRNAs are delivered to the ribosome in complex with EFTU. It will not bind uncharged tRNA. And it has approximately the same affinity for any am amino acyl tRNA. In this way, we ensure that it is equally likely to deliver any tRNA to the ribosome. What's going to drive which tRNA base pairs is that complementary base pairing between the anticodon of the tRNA and the codon in the mRNA. How do we ensure that that base pairing is correct? Well, so what we're looking at now is a kind of proofreading mechanism that the ribosome has. On the far left we have an illustration representing a ribbon diagram of, of a crystal structure that was determined of the A site of the 30S subunit. Notice in the rRNA, which is in gray, there are two adjacent A residues and these play an important role in this proofreading process. On the far right we have a representation of the mRNA in purple and an analog of the tRNA in gold. So our incoming tRNA will base pair with the mRNA and those two A residues in the rRNA of the ribosome will play a role in checking that interaction. If the base pairing is correct, those two A residues will move their, from their original position, essentially flip out and make contact with two residues, the two adjacent nucleotides within the codon of the mRNA. So if the base pairing is correct between the tRNA and the mRNA, then those two A residues can make appropriate contacts and therefore that will continue the process of elongation and transpeptidation as we'll see in just a moment. If however that base pairing is incorrect, those two adenine residues cannot make those contacts and that's how we determine whether or not that's the proper interaction between the anticodon of the tRNA and the codon of the mRNA. This is the rate limiting step of protein synthesis. Base pairing between the tRNA and mRNA and the proofreading by these two A residues. You'll notice we only need two A residues even though there are three nucleotides within the codon. Remember that third base wobble? So that third base isn't so important as the first two and those are the two that we have to check and make sure that the interactions, the base pairing, is correct. As we'll see, although it's the ribosomal RNA that confirms that the interaction is correct, our actual proofreader is EFTU and that's illustrated here. Here we have our growing chain on the tRNA in the P site and EFTU is delivering the next tRNA to that A site. Those two A residues in the rRNA is going to make sure, are going to make sure that that interaction is correct. EFTU then will will then hydrolyze GTP. It will EFTU will then release bound to GDP and we can begin the process of transpeptidation. We'll look at that process in just a moment. On the other hand, let's say that the wrong tRNA was associated in the A site. EFTU is bound to GTP and complex to that tRNA molecule and so the base pairing interactions, if it's the wrong tRNA, are incorrect and of those two A residues in the rRNA cannot make contact. Although that actual proofreading appears to be the rRNA, it's EFTU that makes the final decision. If those contacts are not correct, it will dissociate from the ribosome without hydrolyzing the GTP. In other words, it leaves with the tRNA. 
After all, there's nothing wrong with the tRNA molecule. We're just not ready to use it in this position. So it dissociates, nothing is added, and now we're ready for a separate EFT molecule, EFTU, to bring in the correct tRNA. So in this way, EFTU limits the error rate in protein synthesis to 1 in 10,000. Here is a table from your book illustrating a number of translation factors. We've already considered IF2 in the prokaryotic system, and we just looked at EFTU. In just a moment, we'll look at EFG, which is going to promote translocation, as we'll see. And then in the next lesson, we'll look at translation termination, and we'll see the role of these release factors 1 and 2. You want to know the roles that these prokaryotic play proteins play in initiation, elongation, and in termination. You'll see that there are corresponding proteins in eukaryotic systems, but you will be held responsible only for the prokaryotic versions and for their relative roles. The animation that we'll examine in class should help to clarify and keep these straight in your minds. Let's look at that process of transpeptidation. Let's assume the correct tRNA has base paired, and now we're ready for that transpeptidation reaction, and that's what's illustrated here. We have our growing chain attached to a tRNA molecule in our P site, and here's the, the tRNA that was just delivered to the A site, carrying the next amino acid to add. So our growing peptide chain is in blue, and our new amino acid is in green. Now you'll notice because of the connection between the alpha carboxy group of the amino acid and the 3' OH of the tRNA, the amine group is free, and that gives us our nucleophile. So there's the lone pair of the nitrogen, that's our nucleophile that's going to attack that carbonyl carbon attached to the end of our chain here attached to the tRNA and that's the direction of attack from the A to the P site, but you'll notice as we do that the movement is to move the chain from the P to the A site. And so now we have an uncharged tRNA in the P site and our growing chain in the A site. It is because of the attachment of the amino acid to the tRNA, that free amino end, that is why our polypeptide chain grows from the N to the C terminus. And this is an example, again, of a ribozyme and RNA catalyst. So we've carried out transpeptidation, and now we're ready to move to the next codon so that we can add the next amino acid. For that, we need to move our ribosome. And here's where the next elongation factor comes into play, EFG. It facilitates translocation. That is, we want to shift to the ribosome by one codon. The three-dimensional structure of EFG resembles that of EFTU bound to its tRNA, and so you can see how it can fit within the ribosome. Let's see how that process works. Here at the top of the screen we have our ribosome, our growing chain is in the P site, EFTU delivers the next tRNA carrying the cognate amino acid into the A site. We'll assume that it was the correct tRNA, so EFTU is hydrolyzed and releases a bounded GDP. And now here we have our tRNA molecule in the A site. Transpeptation occurs, as we just saw. Attack is from the A to the P site. It's our that alpha amine group on the incoming amino acid that is our nucleophile. And our polypeptide chain moves from the P to the A site. Now we have an empty tRNA in the P site, and our polypeptide chain is attached to the tRNA in the A site. Now we're ready for EFG to do its job to displace the tRNA in the A site and move it to the P site. EFG is also a G protein, so it's bound to GTP. It will come in, and because it resembles very closely EFTU bound to the tRNA, it fits very nicely in that A site and moves the ribosome, ratchets it, essentially, and that moves the tRNA with the polypeptide chain bound, moves that from the A site to the P site. What's not illustrated here is that empty tRNA moves to the E site and eventually dissociates here. 
The next thing that occurs is GTP hydrolysis by EFG and that releases that elongation factor. And now we're ready to begin another cycle. Another tRNA is brought in by EFTU and we're ready to add the next amino acid. And so this is how the elongation cycle continues. EFTU delivering the correct tRNA to the A site and EFG carrying out translocation. In the next video lesson, we'll look at the mechanism for translation termination and we'll see uh, the advantage that prokaryotes have of not having a nucleus.